Today on the show, my friend Robert joins me to talk about his first visit to Hong Kong Disneyland. Like all Disney fans, we have preconceived notions of what our experiences will be when visiting a Disney park for the first time. Listen to hear how it lived up to Robert's expectations as we discuss how to get to the resort, the later-than-expected opening time, how characters seem to be more popular than rides based on wait times, the shopping and food, and what Robert thought of the park's newest land, World of Frozen. Whether you're thinking about visiting Hong Kong Disneyland yourself or simply living vicariously through Robert's journey, enjoy our conversation all about Hong Kong Disneyland. Travel along and stamp those passports in today's Disney Trip Report. Hello, Robert, and welcome back to Disney Coast to Coast. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Thanks for having me back, Jeff. Yeah, well, we have to talk about something because every time I've seen you since you've gone to Hong Kong Disneyland, you're just like, oh, I want to rub it in your face. I went to Hong Kong Disneyland. I have so much I want to talk to you about. And I just say, Robert, stop. Don't talk about it. We've got to record this conversation. So now is your moment. This is the moment to rub it in my face that you went to Hong Kong Disneyland, had a fantastic time, and I've never been because I simply can't get over the flight length. Someday I will. <laughs> but uh, sound accurate? Yeah. So I, I'm actually terrified of flying. So it actually, you know, me flying on a plane that long was uh, was was a little bit of a challenge. So, you know, I don't do these long flights uh, very often. But also it was kind of a kind of a last minute thing. I, I was going on a business trip to Chennai, India, and my company was very nice to l- allow me to do a layover on the way up to Chennai and a layover on the way back to Chennai. So yeah, I spent three days in uh, in Disneyland Hong Kong. And you are an annual pass holder now? Is that true? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I crunched a little numbers and I also thought the the annual pass holder card looked pretty cool. <laughs> so it was uh, the I, I became a platinum annual pass holder, and and that's uh, that was roughly five hundred USD, and you get so many different benefits. You get you know hotel discounts, food discounts. Obviously, you could go into the park, uh, uh, you know, and not have to pay for the ticket. And you know, being in the park for three days almost paid for the pass itself. And then you know, th- there's a chance that I may be back in the next year anyways for another business trip. And then you also get some other benefits. So I I visited three times in three months. So uh, it was really three times in, in just a week. And then, you know, you get uh, you get different pins uh, the more you visit. So I got a, a frozen Olaf pin, which, you know, probably was related to, you know, um, Arendelle opening up there. They could never do incentives at Disneyland Resort to get people to come. So this is interesting, right? They're trying to incentivize people to return by giving them pins. Visit us three times in three months, you get this pin. I believe it's another 10 visits in a year. You also get a different pin. Yes. That incentivizing does not need to exist in the domestic parts whatsoever. So it's kind of interesting, really. I'm just a very different run park. Of course, we're going to get into all of those details, but I do think it's fascinating that they incentivize their annual pass holders to come. Whereas here in the States, it's like, no, we're please asking you not to come. And also we're going to make it so you cannot come. And that is not the case at Hong Kong so much. Yeah. And I think these pins are specific to that program. It's not like you could just walk into a pin store and get uh, the same pin. So, you know, that's a nice touch as well. And that platinum level, that's the top level, correct? That's the top level, correct. So $500 top level annual pass. Of course, it's one park. It's a small park. We'll get into all of that in a moment. But I do want to talk about, you know, when people are traveling overseas to Hong Kong to visit Hong Kong Disneyland, one of the big concerns or just logistic concerns that comes up is travel and transportation. How easy or difficult and how many options do they have? to get from the city and or airport to Hong Kong Disneyland. Yeah, it's, it's really easy. So uh, when I was traveling to Chennai on the way there, to India, um, you know, we had a, uh, I was with a colleague, we had a 15 hour layover and I, and I, I wait, 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 did you convince your colleague to come to Hong Kong Disneyland <laughs> and, or were they a Disney fan whatsoever? Uh, he's a big Disney fan. It was okay. not really hard to do. Although he decided to stay in the airport that day 
And I, I didn't want to take any chances. You know, the flights could always be delayed. Something could happen. I'm like, you know, I'm going to go into, you know, Disneyland Hong Kong this day, no matter what. Uh, so my, my friend hung out at some fancy lounges at the airport and I left, I left the airport and it's really easy to leave the airport. Uh, if, if you're, if you're a U.S. pass holder, um, you know, there's really, there, there's no scrutiny. You just kind of walk out. Uh, you could stay there 90 days at a time, a hundred and 180 days total a year. And, uh, yeah, I, I specifically plan the flight to, uh, correlate with the, Hong Kong, Disneyland, Hong Kong opening hours. So I was there pretty much the whole day. So if you have a U.S. passport, it's simple to get to and from. There's no chaos to deal with. It's really easy. Uh, there's a uh, they have like a subway system that I think will actually get you there. Although I didn't take that. Um, I jumped in a taxi and the taxis are, are easily labeled. They're, they're color coded. So I believe I took a blue taxi. And uh, it's about a 15 minute or so taxi ride from the airport. It, it's extremely easy. Wow. So, I mean, that's super convenient. And it's kind of, uh, although close, it's kind of secluded off on its own, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I, I'm not too familiar with Hong Kong. I didn't really venture around that area. This is the first time I've been to Hong Kong. And of course, I went straight to Disneyland, Hong Kong. Um, but yeah, it's uh, we I, we cross some large bridge, and then it's kind of in the middle of this mountain range, and it, it's really uh, interesting seeing something similar to what we have in North America, but like surrounded by mountains was a very different feel and look. So nice. So they have various options, including taxis. You mentioned like a subway. They have a train station, I believe, right? Buses. So there's a bunch of options. Yeah, they, they, it has the resort buses as well. And um, you could actually, if you're staying on the resort, which I did, uh, at least on on the trip on the way back, you could either walk to the park. And it's it's a little bit of a walk. It's probably like a 10-minute walk. Or, you know, you jump on a five-minute bus ride that leaves, you know, every 10 minutes or so. And remind me, how long was this layover for this first visit? Uh, the first visit was 15 hours. So I, I pretty much spent, you know... I maximized my time in the park that day. Um, I believe the park opened up at 1030. So it opens up on the later side. It does close at nine. Uh, so I, I was there, you know, most of the the park opening and to closing. And uh, yeah, and then I just uh, took a, a, a taxi back to the airport and then jumped right on my flight and, and uh, went on to my business trip at that point. Wild. Wow. That's a, uh, that's, that's an intense layover right there. Well, let's talk about park opening. It sounds like it opens at around 1030 in the morning, which of course, for us residents in the US, that sounds very late, a 1030 a.m. opening. You know, their, their rope drop or whatever is equivalent to their rope drop, it's not as crazy as, say, you know, our, our Anaheim Park. You know, there's still a lot of people there. They, they do offer an early entry where you have to pay an additional fee. I think it's like a $20 additional USD. Even if you're, I think even if you're staying at the hotel, if you want to do early entry, you have to pay that additional uh, money. I, I couldn't figure, I, it was hard for me to figure out if the early entry was 30 or 60 minutes before. And, and one of the reasons for that is they don't, the park doesn't open all the lands at the same time. So you get there and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe one out of the six lands are open. I'm just throwing a number out there. I don't actually know how many lands there are. I have to count them. But, you know, they, they kind of do this staged land opening. And, and, and that actually, I feel, reduces a lot of the chaos as well. And I don't know if it's a staffing issue or it just works for them, but that was kind of an interesting way of opening a park. Yeah, I feel like some of the U.S. parks unofficially do that. I've definitely, I know Universal Florida for sure does that. And part of it is because when they let you in the front gate, it takes a good 20 minutes or whatever to walk to the other end. Or, you know, you could run in 10 minutes or something, but they will stagger opening of attractions for staffing purposes typically. So it's interesting. And I'm, I, I don't know if Disney officially does that or if they just often have broken down rides at the beginning of the day. I'm not certain but a lot of times that happens yeah maybe a little bit of both who knows all right so it opens a little later than we're used to although i guess if you want to go in our quote-unquote normal time you can pay to do that as is the disney way and yeah how did you feel you know with the late opening and you said closed around 9 p.m that's not terribly late 
how did you do as far as getting on what you wanted to get on? Yeah, so the the first day there, uh, it was just me not really having anything planned in general. It was just kind of me taking on or taking in the park. And, and you know, the first thing that I noticed is when I, I – uh, well, first of all, there's this long, like, walkway to the park itself. And, and I, I don't know why it's so long. Like, it, it's actually, like, several blocks – uh, in length just to get to the park when they drop you off from either the taxi or the bus station. And and maybe there's a lot of infrastructure there. I know there's a subway. Maybe there's a reason wh- why that's there. But then there's this huge uh, uh, like water statue uh, right near the park entrance. And it's like it has a huge whale. And, and there's uh, kind of like the main Disney characters are there playing in the water. It's this very beautiful structure there. A statue. It's not actually Mickey playing in the water. Yeah, it's, it's not like Mickey in his costume, uh, uh, you know, playing in the water. You know, I mean, they do that with uh, scuba diving every once in a while, like at Epcot, right? I'm always amazed. They they do it for a lot of TV specials where Goofy will be in a hot tub or whatever. And um, it still, to this day, blows my mind that they put the characters in in you know that that wardrobe in water i'm just like that must be terribly uncomfortable but i digress you're talking of a statue yeah yeah it, it it's really a gorgeous pretty large and then and then to the right of that statue is actually the the park entrance and uh one of the things and, and getting into the park is uh a little interesting as well. You know, you know, I don't speak the local language and you, you're not quite sure which line you're supposed to go into. So that was a little chaotic. Uh, I finally convinced someone that I'm a, um, oh, I forgot to mention this. I, so I, I had to pick up my pass holder or my pass, my annual pass when, when I first got there. And I didn't want to stand in this really long line and not be in the right line. So there was a little bit of convincing and talking to the right people to to be able to skip that entire line to go to a certain booth to pick up my 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 pass. So so that was kind of the first thing I wanted to do. And and one of the reasons why I wanted to pick up my pass immediately as well is because you know you uh, is that I can't make any you have to make reservations to go into the park at a later time at, on a later date I should say. And I don't know how quickly those fill up. So I wanted to make reservations as soon as I got that pass. So that was kind of like the first mission. But as, outside of that, I didn't really have anything planned. And and one of the, the first things I noticed when I got through the gates, you know, it looks just like, you know, the original Disneyland in, in Anaheim. I mean, the gates look the same, the front area where, where the, the, you know, the grass is and uh, normally where you would see Mickey Mouse and, and the flowers and then, you know, the train station, that looks all the same. With one big exception, there's a huge Duffy face instead of Mickey. So that's when that was like the first clue that I'm not in, you know, I'm not back home. This is a very different park. Uh, kind of, I felt like I was in like an alternate like universe at this point, starting starting at that point. So Mickey floral is Duffy floral in Hong Kong Disneyland. And I'm pretty sure, I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure that's a quote unquote permanent thing. I don't think there's a special Duffy celebration that was going on or anything, but I could be mistaken. I, I know Duffy's huge overseas. And so, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all. My understanding is that's permanent. And, you know, Duffy has a, a much larger presence. Duffy and his pals have a much larger presence in the park than Mickey and Minnie or, or Goofy or Pluto or Donald Duck or Daisy. Right. That's wild. So I, I made it through the, you know, there's a tunnel to the left and to the right. And then, you know, you have the attraction posters. So, you know, there's attraction posters specific to this park. And then I got to Main Street again. Main Street looks like an exact, you know, replica of Main Street USA, you know, in Disneyland. Right. So I, so the first thing I did was like, OK, well, I'm going to go see, you know, is there a firehouse? Is there Walt's apartment? So I, I, went, I went to the right and it was like, oh, there is a firehouse. and the interesting thing about the firehouse was it was like a wheelchair rental area. So it, it looked like a firehouse, but it was actually like a, um, you know, a, 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 a rental place. All right. So that's on Main Street. And other than that, looks pretty similar. I know certain things were missing, correct? Things you're used to. Yeah. So I, I don't recall there being a silhouette store. Uh, going back to the firehouse, I, I thought it was cute that the flag that they had flying was a Dalmatian flag, which is a famous, you know, fire fighting dog. 
Mm-hmm. So I thought that was pretty cute. You know, they're like their candy stores are, are, are a little bit different from the exterior. It very much looks like the Anaheim Park. But then when you actually go into the stores, it's like, no, this this is a very different place, very different merchandise, different treats and things like that. But no churros on Main Street, it sounds like. I did not see any churro stands at all. Maybe there are some in the park, but they're not like every you know couple hundred feet like they are in Disneyland. Um, there were popcorn stands. And, and instead of like flavored churros or having the flavored churro sauces like in Disneyland, they were uh, – Hong Kong was very much into their flavored popcorn. So I, I think there was like a grape flavored – and uh, there was one popcorn that was just called like uh, American style popcorn or something like that. So, <laughs> so just loaded popcorn. with butter and salt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so they had some interesting popcorn flavors. I wanted to try the grape popcorn since I really like grape flavor, but I never got to it. Oh, man, you got to go back. Good thing you have an annual pass. Yeah. Yeah. I have uh, what at least like nine, eight or nine months left on it. So, yeah. Excellent. All right. So beyond Main Street USA, let's touch on some of the other lands that exist in the domestic parks as well. Let's start with Adventureland and talk about some of the differences you saw between your, we should mention your main park, although of course you've been to Walt Disney World, you spend a much greater time at Disneyland Resort. So you're used to Disneyland Resort Adventureland. How did that compare to Hong Kong Disneyland's? Yeah, so uh, so the Ventureland in Hong Kong, they, they have a Jungle Cruise and they have like a rivers, like a Rivers of America. Interesting. So the Rivers of America, because they don't have Frontierland, they kind of stuck it in Adventureland. Yes, and then what what I saw there is you know they don't like they don't have a huge uh, boat uh, like the Mark Twain or the Columbia. Um, but they have the Jungle Cruise ride, and it's actually on the main on on the main like body of water there. So you know, I had to go on that. I want to compare you know the Jungle Cruise ride in Hong Kong compared to you know all, all you know the other parks as well. And and I must say, it was actually my favorite Jungle Cruise ride out of all the parks. It was it was very classic and themed. It's not enclosed very uh, like like the uh, like the uh, Walt Disney World or, or Disneyland ride where um you know it, it's you feel like you're kind of in like a uh, you know like a very thin river like a nile um it's kind of mostly on the main body of water but it still has lots of special effects a lot of classic you, what would i would consider like more classic special effects and then they they added some more modern touches at the end that that made it that just kind of plus the ride like there was at the very end of the ride they were pretended like you know there's two forks in the in in the river and, you know, to the left side, you'd, you would go over these falls. So they kind of simulated like this really rough kind of rapids uh, uh, with the water flowing and everything. And then they diverted you to the right at the last minute. And then you come to kind of like this temple and there's some sort of like temple god there. It's some sort of water or fire temple god. And, and there's a lot of like pyro and, and water and the boat moves around, and basically this this god tries to sink you with with fire and water, and and that's like kind of the grand finale of of that ride. And it's you know it, it's it's such a great ride. I did a little research afterwards, and I read online. It's like, what do other people think of this ride? And and a lot of times when they do polling on this ride, a lot of people say that's the best Jungle Cruise ride. Very cool. Now, obviously, one of the staples of the Jungle Cruise is the skipper. I'm going to assume. You didn't understand a word they said, correct? Uh, the skipper tried to, you know, say a few jokes in English. So at one time, there used to be three, I believe, three lines for the Jungle Cruise for different languages. And and that's no longer used. So I, I uh, you know, I, I did research before I got there and I was looking forward to jumping in the English line. Right. And and that no longer existed. So I was, you know, I got what I got. Um, you know, I didn't understand like 90% of it, but the, the skipper, you know, did see me on the boat or recognize there were some, uh, you know, people from other countries traveling there and, and, and she tried her best. Um, I could say that, you know, her energy she brought to it, you know, felt very similar to, you know, the, the domestic park. So, you know, she was really into her, uh, her role. What else was going on in Adventureland? They do have, uh, like in Walt Disney World, they have the the tiki's that like spit the water at you. 
Mm. They they had something very similar to that uh, there as well. It actually looked like it was, uh, you know, copies of that. Um, so that that was pretty pretty cool. I think are they called leaky tikis or likey tikis? I think it would be pronounced leaky tiki as my guess. Yeah, like it's leaking. Right. Get it leaky? Yeah, leaky. Yeah, they're leaky tikis. They have some theaters there. Um, I wasn't able to catch the shows, but I think they have the Wild Lion King show. It was not running while I was there. So this is different from Festival of the Lion King because I know they have that as well. This is a different another Lion King show in the same park. Yes, it's another Lion King show. And then they also had a um, Moana show that I think was like 15 or 20 minutes long. And unfortunately, I I missed that as well. I was trying to catch the shows, but, you know, there's just so many things to do in the park the the first day. So so that's pretty much Adventureland. That's pretty much Adventureland. Um, so other lands that are similar to ours or, or, or we have here, at least, is uh, I went to Tomorrowland. So Tomorrowland, um, they have uh, an Ant-Man and a Wasp ride. Uh, think of like Buzz Lightyear, uh, Astro Blasters. So, uh, but with uh, like uh, more video screens, you know, I think a Buzz Lightyear doesn't have any, it, it's all like practical, uh, like, um, you know, audio animatronics in that ride. In fact, it replaced Buzz Lightyear. We did a whole episode with Kyle Burbank, who went and visited this attraction, Ant-Man and the Wasp Nano Battle, episode 621 of Disney Coast to Coast. So you can hear even more about that, but you're describing it perfectly. It's Buzz Lightyear because it is Buzz Lightyear. You could very much tell like, you know, that's the new overlay or the new themed. And, you know, that ride was actually disappointing to me. Um, you, you shoot at these targets that reset very quickly and they're really easy to shoot at. And, um, you know, there, there's no challenge. And overall, it's just kind of a boring ride. So, you know, I, I, I went on that, I think, twice, once by myself and then once with my colleague. Um, they also have an Iron Man ride, which is wait, wait, next. wait! Before you get on, we've we've got to talk about this because I know you're very competitive. So, did you just not score well, and that's why you're not a fan of the ride, or are you being fair? Uh, no, I, I think it's the other way around. Where I, you could easily score very high scores, very easily. Okay, like even a little bit of effort, you're going to get a high score. So, yeah, it, it's not like Buzz Lightyear. Uh, where, uh, you know, it takes a lot of effort and sometimes luck to, to max out the, you know, 999,000 score, right? Did you happen to catch the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids reference in the attraction? Um, I didn't, but I know you're going to tell me about it now. Paul Rudd, uh, you know, Ant-Man, he mentions like a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids thing because, of course, they're shrunken stuff. I can't remember the exact thing, but but I know that there was a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids reference in that attraction, so... That's a win. But in any case, I digress. Let's move on to, you said Iron Man, correct? Yeah, there, there's an Iron Man ride, which is like right next to Ant-Man and the Wasp. And and that is, that's basically Star Tours, but with uh, an Iron Man story overlaid on top of it. Uh, it, it feels, it, it's the same, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised it was, if it was the exact same, you know, machinery, whatever they used for it, right? Yeah, it used to be Star Tours. It's an overlay of Star Tours. Yeah. yeah. It did feel like uh, it felt uh, like more crisp and newer and there was less like hydraulic noises. It was more smooth. It was more in, in tune with the, you know, the, the, the movements on the screen. It just felt like, you know, it had a lot more, it had a lot less wear and tear on it than our Star Tours in uh, Disneyland. Very cool. So that's part of Tomorrowland. So Tomorrowland there has become very Marvel centric, kind of like the way ours has become very Star Wars centric. Yeah. They don't have an Avengers campus in Hong Kong. So this is kind of it. Yeah, but th- there, they do have a Space Mountain that has a uh, a Star Wars overlay. I don't know if that was always like that. I, I think it was probably something they changed after the fact. It was probably Space Mountain originally. You probably have more information on that. And then now it, they just, they don't change the Star Wars overlay. It's just themed like that all the time. And they even have a full-size X-Wing on the outside of the of the attraction. Very nice. Another land that exists here in the domestic parks, of course, is Fantasyland. I, I know I went on It's a Small World, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's just like ours, um, with the exception of they have like an ice cream store right across from it, which I thought was really cool. 
Um, I don't think we have that here. Uh, so, you know, that, that was a nice touch. Um, you know, I imagine if you take your family there, everyone's going to want to hit the ice cream store before or, or after, uh, you know, going on that ride. Cinderella's uh, carousel. I was looking for jingles. Uh, so there was no jingles. Jingles is Mary Poppins horse. And you, we have that horse in um, in Disneyland. And actually, Mary Poppins, um, I think, rides it almost every day as well on a certain time. But yeah, it's a special horse dedicated to, to her, to the actress. To Julie Andrews. Yeah. Uh, they, they have Dumbo. Uh, I did go on Winnie the Pooh. It's very much like ours. Now, is that the trackless one or no? Where's the trackless one at? The trackless one is in Tokyo. Okay. But yeah, our, it, this one felt very much like ours. I was actually hoping it was kind of like the trackless version of, of Disneyland Tokyo's because that's a really, really cool ride. Um, they also had teacups. And uh, they have areas over there uh, where you could take uh, photos with the princesses. They have something called Fantasy Garden and Fairy Tale Forest. Uh, so Fairy Tale Forest was was if if I, if I would compare it to something, I would compare it to our Pixie Hollow in uh, Disneyland. In Fairy Tale Forest, they also have uh, lots of like castle, like uh, di- different photo opportunities and. Uh, castles and scenery from from all the different stories. So uh, I kind of compared it to um, like Pixie Hollow uh, met up with the Storybook Canal in in Disneyland. That's kind of like the sense I got from that. Of course, it was on land though, not not on water. So very cool. And of course, when you're talking about Fantasyland, you have to talk about the fairly new-ish Castle of Magical Dreams. Now this park originally had an exact replica of Sleeping Beauty Castle from Disneyland, the original Disneyland in California. And, you know, fairly recently, they decided we're gonna plus that. So they've made the Castle of Magical Dreams. It is not assigned to any specific princess. It's kind of an amalgamation. And what were your thoughts on this? Because I have not seen it in person, obviously, but I don't love what I see. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that's why I like it so much, Jeff. Yeah, we have very opposite taste, yes. Yeah, so it used to be Sleeping Beauty's castle, and there was a new castle built, Castle of Magical Dreams. And uh, so my understanding is they built on top of the old Sleeping Beauty castle. So so that's nice to hear. I'm glad to hear that it's it's like not technically torn down. I don't think you could actually see any of it. Um, you know, it, it's there, but you wouldn't really know it's there. Maybe that's like a fun fact. Oh, so the Castle of Magical Dreams um, represents 12 Disney princesses and two frozen queens. So that would be Snow White, Cinderella, Aurora, Ariel, Belle, Jasmine, Pocahontas, Mulan, Tiana, Rapunzel, Merida, and Anna and Elsa and Moana. So they're, they're a little mixed up in there, but 12 princesses and two frozen queens. And, and each of those spire um, represents either the, you know a princess or a queen. So, you know, there would be a spire that's just dedicated to uh, Moana or one dedicated to Ariel. And I was just, again, blown away by this castle. It's gorgeous. I, I know this may be a bit controversial, especially for me living in uh, the original uh, you know, or living near the original Disneyland Park. But I would say it's it's my favorite castle out of all the castles that I've visited. Really? Yeah. Have you been to Disneyland Paris? I have not. I okay. am maybe going to go next year. Uh, Disneyland Paris Sleeping Beauty Castle is stunning, like truly stunning. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts after having seen that one. But interesting. I'll let you know. I mean, there's also a, a just a beautiful uh, nighttime show. Um, it, it's it's very humid and wet, rainy in Hong Kong all the time. So I, I don't actually know if they do fireworks, but... They, they do this uh, castle projection show. Uh, and then, then they also have, uh, think of like World of Color. They have a huge area in front of the castle where uh, they do a World of Color show and then they have music and they also project on the castle. And, and also since the castle is so large, it's very easy to, to see it from most places, uh, you know, from Main Street down. Uh, so, you know, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of people get to see this amazing show and they don't need to have like the best seats or, or, or the best location to see it. And, and just an incredible show. 
Yeah, and it's called Momentous. That's the name of their nighttime spectacular. So, very cool. Let's talk about another land that exists somewhere in the domestic parks, and that would be Toy Story Land. Not quite in Disneyland, but of course, over at Disney's Hollywood Studios, we have a Toy Story Land. How does it compare to Disney's Hollywood Studios' Toy Story Land? So I, I mainly walked through that land. You know, what I what I noticed is I felt like a lot of the rides felt more like carnival, like off the shelf sort of rides. They had a Toy Story parachute drop. So think of your typical like carnival drop ride that you see at a lot of places. Uh, they had a Slinky Dog spin. So so not like the Slinky Dog roller coaster that that we have in um, Walt Disney World, but this just kind of went around in a circle. So again, a carnival ride style. And they also had a ride called RC Racer, and I, it was it was the big RC car from Toy Story, and I think it just went uh, like back and forth on like a, I think like of a skateboard ramp sort of thing, and it just kind of went went back and forth as well. So I, I didn't find it particularly interesting. I mean, there were some cool photo ops there, uh, but outside of that, you know, I just kind of passed on all of them since they were you know very very much you could find this ride. And, uh, you know, themed differently at, at pretty much most theme parks. Was it a visually interesting land and or did it have similar vibes to Hollywood Studios or did you notice anything kind of majorly different? It had similar vibe, uh, vibes, uh, you, you know, like just like with Hollywood Studios, you walk in and there's the big Woody there greeting you. Uh, so there were definitely photo ops. It's just the, you know, there wasn't there was no e-ticket right there, I would consider. For me, even being a really huge Toy Story fan, it, it's probably my favorite movies out of the Pixar franchise. Um, it, it wasn't interesting for me enough to go on these rides. The, the rides didn't seem interesting, but it, it was it was definitely fun to walk through at least. Let's move on to some lands that only exist at Hong Kong Disneyland. We've got Mystic Point. And this is the one I think everybody talks about when they go to Hong Kong Disneyland. This is what everybody wants to see. The highlight of Mystic Point, of course, is the attraction Mystic Manor, which they kind of refer to as a 21st century haunted mansion. There is no haunted mansion at Hong Kong Disneyland. So, first of all, had you ruined it for yourself and watched YouTube videos? I have a feeling the answer is yes, because you watch YouTube videos of everything. Or were I you did. surprised? Okay. Well, so I watched YouTube videos, but it, I didn't watch it after I knew I was going into Hong Kong. This was, you know, well before that. And, and you know, I, I really didn't think I would be visiting Disneyland Hong Kong ever. So, you know, I was watching these videos because that was going to be the only way for me to see this. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this this is my favorite attraction in the park. I feel like if if Walt was alive today, you know, what would he make? And he would make he would make Mystic Manor like th this. Just th this just feels like Walt completely, and it 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 almost feels like you know some of Walt's original ideas of a museum of the weird. I think it was called. Either so that was yeah, hev heavily you know designed by Rolly Crump, and the Disney Legend, and that was kind of a precursor and or a you know a pre show for the original Haunted Mansion that never came to fruition. So, yeah, has some Museum of the Weird vibes to it. Okay, very cool. The premise of this is, you know, Albert is a monkey and his master, they collect artifacts from all over the world. Uh, and it has a really fun cue of Albert, like, taking photos uh, all around the world with his master. And what happened is, you know, a you know Albert's a monkey. He's very curious. He, he gets into trouble. Uh, there, there's a pre-show where um, they're discussing how they just came across this artifact and it could bring objects to life. And Albert, please don't touch this artifact. And Albert's like, yeah, of course, I'm not going to I'm not going to touch this artifact. Everything's fine. And then, of course, complete chaos ensues. Right. Uh, it's a trackless ride, uh, you know, very much like uh, Mickey and Minnie's run Runaway Railway. So it, it, could, it changes a little bit. Every single time you go on it, you might take a slightly different path. So you, you're kind of going around this ride and you're coming across like a painting that will come to life or a music box that, you know, starts playing music and things like that or, or, or pieces of armor that, that, that start moving and, and, and talking to you. And it, it's just, it's so beautiful. The music's great. Uh, Albert is 
so lovable. Um, I can't say more nice things about it. It's just an, an incredible ride. And, you know, uh, I doubt we would ever see this ride in any of the other parks, but, you know, I, I would I would welcome it. By far one of my, my favorite Disneyland rides of all time and, and my favorite in Disneyland Hong Kong. Yeah, they there's constantly rumors that not this ride, but this similar ride system is going to be coming to the domestic parks. I think the rumor is often Animal Kingdom, perhaps. I don't know if it was Moana or what, but there's, there's always some sort of rumor with that because everybody seems to want Mystic Manor in the States. And I don't know if we'll see that because it's not based on an IP, right? But hopefully that ride system and... I, from what I understand, the effects in there are just incredible. You mentioned the music's great. I don't know if you know, but the score is by Danny Elfman. So, of course, one of the greatest film composers around. So, not surprised at all that Mystic Manor is your favorite in that park. Did you miss having a haunted mansion in that park? Or did it feel like a satisfactory replacement? Or would you not even compare the two? I wouldn't compare the two. Um, they they just felt very different, and I did not miss having a not having a haunted mansion there. Um, I I did like the Mystic Point Land itself. I, I think that may also be my favorite land. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different photo ops there where they have these statues that are are uh, kind of broken up into three different pieces. So they're depending on the perspective that you're looking at these statues, they align or they don't align. So, you know, they, the, the, the theming in the park went really well with, with Mystic Manor. It's just a really lovely, you know, beautifully well done area. Excellent. And is that the only ride there or is there another like sea ticket or something in Mystic Point? Yeah, I believe that's the only ride there because right when you go through that land, that's when you get to uh, the Toy Story land. Okay. Yeah, it's actually it's uh, it's kind of like a walkthrough. It's not like there's an area where you roam roam around a lot in there. It's just like a walkthrough to the Toy Story Land. All righty. Well, newest in the park is World of Frozen, and of course, taking one of Disney's biggest IPs, creating a whole new land around it, and World of Frozen. What were your impressions? Yeah, uh, so that one's right next to It's a Small World. <laughs> so you like you see that It's a Small World, and then I think you go to the right, and then you you dip underneath this bridge. And, you know, it, it's a slow transition into the, you know, Arendelle-themed land. At first glance, I'm like, wow, this this place looks nice. There's a lot of forced perspection, perspective, I should say. But it looks small. You could still, you could still say it looks small. And uh, but it's very well done. Um I went on the uh, Frozen Ever After ride, and which I, my feeling was it, it felt identical to almost identical to the Walt Disney World ride, with the exception of the animatronics were just done better. They were they just didn't use the same ones. They seemed more modern. The movements seemed more, more not fluid. projection, correct? They don't have the projection faces. They don't have the projected faces, uh, so that that was nicer as well. So you know been on that ride quite a few times before you know that was like not something new to me um so it was you know it it didn't really add a lot to the land um it would have been nice if there was like a completely new type of ride there uh, kind of a new water ride there instead of that one and then there was a wanderings oaken sliding sleighs and and i must say this is actually my least favorite roller coaster of any disneyland theme park uh, it is so short, and and I actually looked online. It's one of the shortest roller coasters ever made. I, I think if you time time the ride from going up the lift to actually going through the entire ride, it was like twenty five seconds long. And, and people wait a long time for this ride because it's a newer ride. But you know, it's it's like as soon as the ride starts, it's over, and you just don't know what has happened. And you know, there's not a lot of theming in the ride. You're you're kind of going through a, a mountain. A little bit kind of an open mountain but the only theming is like i think there's olaf in the beginning so spin and olaf and i think olaf is like tempting spin with like a carrot i think it might be the carrot from olaf's nose to kind of power the ride so that's cute so you know spin's powering the ride but it's such a short ride and it was like you know it, I, they just didn't have enough space or budget but you know that was disappointing i, I that ride needed to be you know 
you know, a short ride to me is like Tron light cycle run. Like I thought that ride needed to be at light, at least the 60 seconds of Tron light cycle run. I mean, when you say short, are you talking Chippendale gadget coaster short in Mickey's Toontown or a little longer? It's probably a little longer. Um, I, I would have to look at that ride. So this ride, I, no, I'm not joking. This ride was 25 seconds in, uh, you know, long from, from like start to finish. So I would have to time... <laughs> I would time I would have to time that other one in Mickey's Toontown to to see how long that one is. I feel like it's probably a little longer than the one in Toontown, but not by much. That's crazy. Cause I know that that was I mean, was it at least visually beautiful when you see it in the land? You're like, oh, that's a gorgeous mountain. Yeah, it's a nice mountain. Um, you know, Spen powering the the ride and with Olaf you know, teasing him with a carrot, I thought was really cute, but, but like, that's the only animatronic in the ride. And then it's, it's a very quick, you know, roller coaster ride. And, uh, you know, you see a little bit of the land while you're on the roller coaster ride, but it, it goes by so quickly. You're kind of shocked at the end, the first time you go on it, because it's like, you're like, Oh, this is cool. Oh, this is over. It went from, this is cool to, Oh, it's over in like a few seconds. Crazy. Did you try any of the new food and treats in world of frozen? Yeah, I went to the Golden, is it Crocus Inn, if I'm pronouncing that right? Um, I had the Cordon Bleu. I I thought it was actually bland. I I really like Cordon Bleus. So it's kind of like a chicken stuffed with ham and Swiss cheese. And uh, maybe my taste buds are off or something. Maybe I was fighting a little cold or something. But, you know, the the restaurant itself was, you know, nothing spectacular. Um, It was themed okay. Lots of Lots of frozen family portraits uh, in there. They, it, it looks like there's an upper section to the restaurant, and, and there isn't. It's just a facade. Hmm. So when I got there, I wanted to go to the upper section based on some of the photos I saw online, but I realized that you can't actually go up there. Um, it was okay. All right. Did you see any performances there? I know they have the Playhouse in the Woods. Did you catch any of that? I did not. All right. So after World of Frozen, let's talk about Grizzly Gulch. Grizzly Gulch, uh, unfortunately, Big Grizzly Mountain Runaway Mine Cars was closed. Ooh. And it was going to open up like a few days after I left. So I wasn't able to go on that. It looked really cool. I, I don't know if it was it's, if it's a good ride or not. Unfortunately, I probably won't be able to go on it for many years or never. Uh, but the area itself, uh, it's themed like an old mining town. Uh, there's a lot of photo ops. There's like jails you could take photos in. There's a big gold nugget that you could take a photo next to. It's pretty much a, a walkthrough. There's a lot of uh, like photo op facades there, but not like not like a lot of stores or I didn't see any character meet and greets there. And then there's just the big ride itself. So since Big Grizzly Mountain Runaway Mine Car was closed, I didn't really spend a lot of time there. I just kind of walked through there. And this is like Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, essentially. Yes, um, that's my understanding or, or something similar to it. I mean, that's what they were trying to go for there. All right. And the park does have some live entertainment. There are shows. There's Moana, a homecoming celebration. Yeah, I wasn't able to see that one. Uh, there's also Festival of the Lion King, uh, which I don't think was running at the time. Mickey's Philip Magic was is just like ours. Uh, So uh, nothing different there. But I did see something that was really incredible. I saw Mickey and the Wondrous Book. And this show really blew me away. Uh, This this felt like a Broadway production. And uh, when I was listening to the actors and actresses sing on stage, I thought it was all dubbed because it sounded too good. And then later I found out that they were everyone was singing live. And it just sounded like they lifted their their voices off of of a movie soundtrack, and I, I was just blown away. It's like every you know the, the the actual acting performance was great, and and the the tone of all of the, of the princesses and princesses' voice and all the actors and actresses they were like spot on, and they were just gorgeous. So so that was really interesting. So there were a few different princesses there. There was Ariel, Merida, Rapunzel, Tiana. And then there's Elsa, which is a queen, I guess. So I have a question for you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, out of everyone, um, you, you may know this already, um, but out of everyone, uh, I was kind of surprised who got the, the biggest applause uh, because there's not really a big presence there. But out of Ariel, Merida, Rapunzel, Tiana, and Elsa, at the end of the show, uh, one princess got, got a huge applause. 
if you say Merida, I'm going to hurt myself. So I don't think it's Merida. <laughs> but, I mean, if you say it's kind of a weird choice, is Tiana big over there? Yeah, so Tiana got a, a, a big round of applause and uh, the biggest out of all of them. And I just didn't really see a Tiana presence in the park. So that was a little surprising, but but they, they really love uh, Tiana's performance that day. Very cool. Did you happen to catch Adventure is Out There or the Follow Your Dreams Castle stage show? I did not, unfortunately. All right. Well, cool. Well, I'm happy there's some live entertainment in the park, although definitely sounds like less than we're used to. We'll get to that in a little bit. It's very rainy there. So, you know, it's very wet, rainy, humid. And I, I feel like, you know, there's probably there's probably more entertainment, but maybe things were canceled that day. Like I didn't see any roaming bands. Well, you went three days. Right. Was it pretty nasty all three days? It was, unfortunately. It was raining off and on for for all three days that I was there to the point where, you know, it, it goes from not raining at all to you're you're drenched in a minute. That's how how big these downpours are. There was one small parade where it was kind of like a train pulling like four or five cars. And then, you know, there were Disney characters, you know, on these cars so they couldn't get wet. So maybe that was like their B mode when it, when the weather gets really bad there. Yeah, that sounds like the rainy day parade for sure. Do you want to touch on the train station for a moment? Because I know it has far fewer stops. Yeah, the train station is really like near and dear to my heart. I'm, I'm really into trains and, you know, it, it's... It's, you know, a big part of Walt's life, right? So, you know, I, I'm always add a little more scrutiny to how they set up the train stations in the parks. And, you know, I was a little surprised, uh, like the, the, the engineers and the conductors, you know, they weren't really dressed in any sort of like train attire. You know, it was just kind of a very generic uh, cast member clothing. So, so that was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, I believe the trains there are also like gas or diesel, uh, you know, so they're not, they're not, they're not real steam trains. So that, that was uh, another disappointment. I'm, you know, every country probably has different, you know, regulations there. And then I, there was only two stations. I think it was, there was the main street station and was it fantasy land? There, there was only two stops. So the train, I mean, Disneyland Hong Kong's a small park in general, but it was two stops and there's not a lot of scenery to see. I, I, actually, there's hardly any scenery to see at all when you're on the ride. And it's a very short ride. So, you know, overall, um, I was expecting a, a little bit more uh, to represent Walt, uh, you know, and his trains in the park. But, you know, it just wasn't there. You know, when people talk about Walt Disney World versus Disneyland, people called Disneyland Park, not the whole resort, but just the park small in comparison, which it is. How would you compare Disneyland Park to Hong Kong Disneyland? It feels even smaller than that. It actually, I mean, to me, it felt about similar in size. And, okay. and I really liked it for that reason. So uh, to me, uh, Walt Disney World is a bit overwhelming to me. Um, you know, I spend 95% of my time uh, at Disneyland. And it's nice to be able to like hop to between two parks that are right next to each other and not really worry about transportation to, you know, you don't have to plan like an hour ahead or two hours ahead that like you have to do in Walt Disney World. So for me, it was a, you know, it, it felt similar in size to Disneyland and it, and that was the charm of it. That's why I really loved and embraced uh, Disneyland Hong Kong was because of its size. Do you want to touch on Mulan? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I found interesting, just like with Duffy, is like which characters are really represented in these parks, and uh, you know, there's a huge Duffy presence. Uh, it's the 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 big long lines for uh, the character meet and greets are Duffy and his pals, Duffy and pals, or Duffy and friends. I'm not sure which way it, it, it it's said. And you know, there's not there's not really like oh, let's go see Mickey or Minnie or Pluto. And and I was thinking you know, what is represented within this culture? And I was expecting to see like Mulan and Mushu and, and things like that. And I, I guess, I guess there was some boycott in the past based on, and don't quote me on this, but based on the Mulan live action movie. And, and since then there, there's really no representation in the park for Mulan. There's no Mulan uh, meet and greets. There's really no Mulan statues there's there's no Mulan merchandise. I think I saw one Mulan uh, pin, one for, you know from the animated movie in there, 
Um, there was one restaurant, they have a plaza in there, which serves a uh, very delicious, like Asian style cuisine in there. So it's, it's like the plaza in from the outside, but on the inside, it, it has Asian themed architecture and, 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 and food. And there was like one, uh, there was a Mushu was in there represented in some artwork in there. But outside of that, there's like, there's no presence of Mulan at all in the park. Is she one of the princesses on the castle? I would assume so. She is. She is on one of the spires. All right, so not as much Mulan as you might expect in Hong Kong Disneyland. Not, not at all. How was the merch? What do you do? You see people walking around with their mouse ears, or what ridiculous things did they get people to put on their heads at Hong Kong Disneyland? So that's the big question. Yeah, so mouse ears aren't really a thing in uh, at that park. There's something similar though. So there's a band that you put on your head, and then there's these little plushies. <laughs> That, that like, you know, there's like you could get the Seven Dwarfs plushie collection or you could get, you know, you could get Toy Store plushies or, you know, you name your movie plushies. And then these plushies are are interchangeable between this headband. So what you see is you see all these little furry, soft ball looking uh, characters that are interchangeable on everyone's head. So, so that's the thing really is that. So those are called the Create Your Own Headbands. Here are the domestic parks. They were introduced at Disneyland Resort during this year's Pixar Fest. They brought them, and they're very popular. And then Disney Springs opened a shop that has them as well. So, yeah, they're they're very big overseas. And this year, we did start bringing them to the, the domestic parks as well. I hope they don't replace mouse ears here. But I doubt they will. The You know, the mouse ears are huge in America. So, yeah. The mouse ears do exist in Hong Kong, except that they're kind of like these very limited edition versions of them. And they're like even more money. Gotcha. So it's like, you know, we're going to sell a very small amount of this particular mouse ear and then just move on. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Any other shopping that that stood out to you? Yeah. So like in Disneyland, you know, we have like our crystal glassware stores that are really famous. Um in Hong Kong Disneyland, uh, they have uh, these uh, gold stores. Like gold is really popular, I guess, there. And there's a lot of gold charms and characters that are plated in gold. And, uh, and you know, uh, you, know you, you could say like dioramas that are plated in gold. Uh, so they have stores that are just dedicated with these gold plated items. And, and, and there's like nothing really inexpensive in these stores. Everything is like, you know thousands to tens of thousands of dollars in these stores uh, you know this is uh, you know something i would imagine you go to like las vegas and you know people want to go to some sort of like really expensive store after they they win a, a fortune right there you know this is where you would go to spend all your money now one of the things i always think about when traveling to a foreign country is food and did you find that they had you know american food if someone going is a picky eater or how did you find that to be? Yeah, so I mean, I'm not a picky eater. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the food for me was actually not as authentic as I wanted it to be. You know, I, I live in the Bay Area. Uh, you know, we this is like a cultural melting pot of, of amazing cuisine out here. So, you know, I, I felt like they were trying to find some sort of middle ground. Uh, so I would say in general, there are a lot of selections, e- even if it looks uh, a little more closer to the to the country or culture you're in it's still going to be like a uh, a, you know a a more bland version of that i would say all right so did you stay at the resort or like in a disney proper hotel or somewhere nearby yeah i did uh i i I stayed at the disney explorer lodge and i believe there's uh, two others there's the hong kong disneyland hotel and disney's hollywood hotel um, when I was looking online, um, the Disney Explorer Lodge looked the most interesting. It, it kind of looked, uh, you know, something you would get, you know, out of like an, the Animal Kingdom Lodge or or maybe I compared it to like a mini Alani. So if, if anyone's ever been to the Alani, uh, think of that sort of architecture. Uh, you know, they have uh, like water uh, uh, fixtures and pools outside that kind of resemble kind of like a Hawaiian themed area as well. They, they don't have a lazy river there, like at the Alani, that would have been really cool, but, um, but very much like that. Very cool. And did you like, how did it compare to, you know, cost wise to the States? Was it kind of a more of a bargain there or not so much? Yeah. So the, the hotels 
in uh, Hong Kong Disneyland are are very reasonably priced, in my opinion, at least compared to North America. Um, I stayed in a pretty large room that could sleep like four to five people that had a balcony and ocean view for roughly $300 a night. An ocean view. Okay, so Hong Kong Disneyland is on the ocean. Uh, yes. You can't see that anywhere from in the park, can you? Uh, you cannot. I mean, I mean, Hong Kong is, you know, uh, is like a city on the bay, right? So it's surrounded by water. But uh, yeah, you cannot see that when you're in the park. You see uh, mountain ranges when you're in the park. Uh, but at the hotel, you, you're, you see uh, basically an ocean bay. Okay, so pretty reasonably priced compared to the States then. Yes. What I would say is more in line priced with like Bay Area, more expensive areas, like Northern California areas would be the food. The food is very comparable in price to what we'd pay in uh, Southern or Northern California. Overall, obviously you went into this with some preconceived notions. How did it live up to it for you? Yes, I talked to some acquaintances and friends that uh, have been to Hong Kong Disneyland before. And, you know, they were telling me it's a small park. It's their least favorite park, Um, you know, uh, comparing it to these, you know, larger, grander parks. Uh, uh, But, you know, based on my preferences of, of, you know, liking smaller parks uh, or, or parks where, you know, you don't have to do a lot of planning ahead, You know, I, you know, I didn't try to form an opinion until I got there. And I I was, I was really pleasantly surprised. Um, I I think it's, uh, I don't think it's too small and I don't think it's too big. It's, it's a very charming park. There were things that reminded me of Disneyland, uh, kind of, you know, brought back kind of a nostalgic, nostalgic kind of feeling as well as seeing cool things that I could never see here, like Mystic Point and, and Mystic Manor. This is going to be again uh you know something that many people are going to disagree with me with but uh, you know i i would say this is my probably my third favorite park when we're looking at like the main park so i would say disneyland is my favorite by far and then i would say uh, tokyo disneyland is my second and i'm talking about the main parks here and then um, hong kong disneyland would be my third uh so you know you know, I haven't been to Paris yet. I haven't I haven't been to Shanghai yet. I have been to Magic Kingdom. But, you know, I, I'm sure you see a pattern here. I, I like, uh, you know, I'm, I like the smaller parks or I like the parks that are relatively close to each other. I don't want to be like traveling, all, you know, all over the place. Um, you know, I would go back in a heartbeat. Um, if I have another business trip in the future there, I will, I will be sure to, you know, choose that as a, a layover location again. I, I highly recommend it. I would say if you hear anything bad about Hong Kong Disneyland and and if you really love Disneyland, uh, I would say that you, you you're gonna you're gonna really like this place. There's no doubt in my mind that you'll you'll like this park. So that's interesting to hear because it is true. I feel like for a lot of people, you know, they'll refer to Hong Kong Disneyland as their second least favorite park, you know, and the winner goes to Walt Disney Studios Park or, you know, the Disney Adventure World Park in Paris. So, yeah, I I love to hear that you enjoyed it so much. You said you ultimately went for three days, correct? Yeah, I I did a 15-hour layover on the way to my business uh, destination because I I wanted to be sure, like, okay, maybe what happens if the plane gets delayed or something happens? I'm going to get at least one day there. And then on the way back, I did a a weekend layover, so two days there. Uh, so yeah, three days in total. And with it being a small park and simply one park, did you find yourself getting bored by day three, or were you still discovering new things? And or did you use any cheats as far as cutting lines? Did you do any sort of lightning lane equivalent, or did you feel that that wasn't necessary there? Yeah, I would say if you're visiting that park, um, three days is probably enough unless you're a crazy fan like I am and you want to like really, you know, spend a lot of time in each land and look at all the shops and 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 just really take it all in, which is what I did. I, I, I probably could have spent there, you know, spent one more day there and would have been fine. But yeah, you know, probably two days or three days is enough for most people. Um, line wise, it wasn't that bad. Um, I think the longest line was like 30 or 40 minutes. And I think it was uh, the uh, Oaken's Wandering Sleigh Ride. 
wow, that's all 30 or 40 minutes for that yes. new ride that is, you know, actually a one of a kind in that park, short or not, it's nowhere else. And it's only 30 or 40 minutes. Yeah, but the meet and greets are a different story. Like if you want to go see Duffy and his pals, you know, that could be like a two hour wait. That's insane. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. All right. Well, things are a bit different, but it uh, sounds like a really fun time. I love that. I got to ask, because I know you are used to visiting the parks with little ones, four-year-olds, seven-year-olds, correct? Am I getting the ages right? And yeah. And your wife. And you were doing this solo and or with an adult friend. What was that experience like for you? Were you like, oh, I forgot this life or I don't know. Or did you mi miss it? Or I I'm sure you missed it. It's your family. But I don't know. Just what was your feelings? Oh, a few feelings. It was lonely. So the the, the first day I was there by myself, it was very lonely. And you, you see everyone with their families and having fun with their children. So there was lonely and guilt about them not being <laughs> not being able to be with me. It was also of me taking notes saying, hey, I really want to take my family here and this is what we're going to do. So me making a lot of mental notes about that. Now, on the other hand, the weather there, the time of year I went and the weather there was very rainy and, uh, you know, uh, downpour, sudden downpours where you would get drenched. And, you know, if I was with my children during that, you know, it would it would be a much difficult or much more difficult situation so every single time I got drenched, uh, you know, which I'm perfectly fine with because, you know, it's warm out there. So it's not like you're cold. You're just wet and warm. Um, I'm like, it's really nice not having my children with me right now because <laughs> we may need to head back to the hotel or or we're going to have to go change their clothes or something. But, yeah, I, I did miss them. But uh, the weather made it uh, a lot easier to not have children with you for that. <laughs> Fair enough. Any final thoughts you want to share on Hong Kong Disneyland? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, whatever you hear, uh, you know, disregard that. Go see go see the park. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Uh, the castle is gorgeous. Uh, Mystic Point and Mystic Manor is very unique. And I don't think you may see that in any other park. So I would go there just to see Mystic Point and, and Mystic Manor and especially the Jungle Cruise. If if uh, if we have anybody out there who's huge Jungle Cruise fans, you must see Hong Kong Disneyland's version of the Jungle Cruise. It's absolutely incredible. Awesome. Well, Robert, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts on your first ever visit to Hong Kong Disneyland. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me back again. I really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Don't miss any future episodes by subscribing and following Disney with a Z, coast to coast on your favorite podcast app, where episodes are available 24-7. This episode has been executive produced by Jeffrey Riccio. Gain rewards like Jeffrey, including access to never-before-heard episodes and live stream Ask Me Anythings, by visiting the Patreon link in this episode's description. Until next time, anything you need can be found in this episode's description, from the DCTC hotline where you can leave a voicemail and be heard on a future episode, contact info to reach me, some free gifts from me to you, and so much more. So be sure to check out this episode's description. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye!